Um, first of all, before I even open this box, because it's just a fantastic gift. I actually should have gotten my furoshiki cloth and wrapped it up. <laughs> but it makes a fantastic gift for an artist. And um, this package is carefully designed. First of all, it's just a great gift. You can wrap it. It's good to go. So the thing I wanted to see, show you is just how it looks when you... I never do unboxing, so I might as well do it, right? Um, got a little bit of bubble wrap. Don't throw it away because you can use that in your gel prints or in watercolor. You can make textures and all that kind of stuff. So keep that. Don't throw it away. You're going to get it this, like Phoebe mentioned, a large Premier water brush. And I'm going to show you today how to fill it, the easiest way to fill it, and how to use it. Because it's a little different than our other water brushes that we've had. These are really nice. So, um, And then, of course, you've seen me well, more than once work with these watercolors. Now... This is the thing I never get to see because this is a brand new set. So I'm, I'm looking at it, showing you now, but I never saved my, I have never saved my color. Uh, what do you call these inserts in these sets? And I'm so glad that I have this one because uh, now I have the actual color names for all of these colors, the 12 colors. These are uh, colors that were mixed specifically to make, to mix. They are picked or chosen by yours truly for their ability to mix together without making mud. And, and if anyone has explored watercolor with me in any way, you'll know that that's, this is the way I've been painting, including acrylics and other mediums. I always love transparent colors. I'm just, that's just what I'm attracted to. So the 12 colors, we have gamboge, hue, two, there's two pigments, but it's still transparent. It's a totally transparent color. Burnt umber is in there. It's a semi-transparent, but it, you know, when mixed with this tran transparent color, you're not going to get mud. Um, burnt sienna is totally transparent. It's a single pigment. And you've got, so, you know, if you get this set, you can get color nerdy if you want and get down, write down the pigment numbers, PRO206, alizarin crimson hue, transparent, permanent rose, PV1919, transparent, purple lake, PV19. Now, isn't that interesting? It's a, a different color, PV19. Interesting. Um, transparent. That could be a typo. <laughs> I'm hoping not. But anyway, um, there's another single pigment. So most of these are single pigments, except we've got the ultramarine, we've got thalo, we've got viridian, single pigments, all transparent. And then we get into the sap green, which has three different pigments, but still transparent, and an indigo, and uh, which is semi and paints gray. So just save your insert if you want to remember your color um, names and pigments. And this water brush, like I said, was, or like Phoebe said, was great. It's a versatile brush and some, a whole pack of this five by seven paper. So I'll set my little box aside and I want to get playing with the, well, first of all, starting with the water brush. I want to talk about the water brush. The water brush Premier is a different one than the Niji, the original Niji water brush, which is uh, beautiful. Of course, it's a great brush. This one is even a little fancier. First of all, it's a real sturdy, it's got a sturdy barrel. So for, for travel, and those of you who travel or just like to take your watercolors, you know, take them in your purse to go to the doctor's office, go to the park. Um, these are great because they don't, they're hard. They're, they're hard. So you're not going to squish them and push water out by accident. There's only one place you can actually press the it's right there. There's a little squishy area right here. So these are very sturdy. Um, the brush tips um, are very nice and long, and they have a, come to a nice point. Uh, the large is the one we like because you can get a nice fine point anyway. So I'm going to show you how I fill that. On um, the sets that we have, so we do have sets. So if you're interested, and Phoebe could list that set. If you're interested in the whole, you know, all the selection, there's actually... We have a set, we have singles and everything, and uh, Phoebe's going to list that. Um, they, co they come in a, we have a brush, what do you call it, a felt tip, which is a bullet tip, um, kind of hard. See, it's hard. It's uh, great for putting ink in if you want to make a marker. It's great for ink. It's great for sumi. I actually fill my uh, brush with sumi ink so I can do some bold marks. Um, another thing that's great about these sets or these boxes. I think these are amazing travel boxes. So don't throw your box away. These are reusable and that's why they were picked. They weren't picked so that you can throw them away. We want to try to have packaging that's 
reusable. And this is uh, one of our first attempts. And I think it's really great because I like that it's kind of a, you call it telescoping, where you can, you can adjust the length, kind of like a brush holder, those old fashioned brush holders are. And in, in Virginia's here, great. So this is a really nice feature. It also protects the brushes. It, and also, if you want to put br regular brushes, like your, you know, fusion brushes, me, yep, looks like they'll fit in there too. If you want to stick a, you know, you want to get a fusion brush in there too, you can do that. So this is a handy little thing. So don't throw your boxes away when you buy, when you buy these. Um, so back, so let me go, oh, then I don't want to miss this one out. This one is a flat brush. It's a wash brush, which, oops, you can keep the insert, or you can, you can throw it away. <laughs> but the wash brush, we need a flat wash brush, right? So we do have one of those. So that's just to let you know, there's on top of, you know, if you want to get into the traveling brush uh, thing, these are great and they're very versatile and very strong. And I'm going to show you how I use them because I'm going to use it today. So here is the large brush. I've already filled it a couple of times. I like to fill it. I've got like this little plain water, nothing fancy. Um, I'm going to, and I'm glad that Phoebe's answering some questions for you. Great. So this is our brush. Now you can fill it by just taking the brush with the tip inside. First of all, you're going to get a starch. When you open these up, they always have a starch tip. So you want to soften those, get rid of that, you know, do it in some clean water. Not the water you're going to be painting with, <laughs> but maybe in a sink or something. Um, I'm finding in, I think in our uh, first time we showed this, we used, we filled it with the tip on. I am discovering that, first of all, there's a couple of reasons why I'm going to talk to you about this. Okay, so back to our set. I'm going to just put this back together. If you knew what my morning was today, I'm so glad I get to watercolor today. I'm just so, so happy that I can spend time watercoloring because it's the most peaceful thing. I want to let you know that this is now a travel. Whoops, it didn't fit. I had it fit earlier. It, well, anyway, I thought I was going to be part of it anyway. It should, wait a minute, I had it once before I was able to do this. Um, and I have it somewhere in my little travel stuff. But, oh yeah, what I did was I moved it around and I was able to get a brush in here. So I'll go back on that and I'll, I won't get you on that for now. I'll probably show you in another, another uh, live how I was able to maximize this case. You definitely can get this in the 24, if you have a 24 pin, for sure. But, all right, let's go back to this. So I took the top off, and the reason I did is I'm finding that it's just easier to fill. Oops, here we go. We have a plunger, and it has like this diaphragm thing going on in here, and it has a little hole. So you can't really just fill it in a sink, like, you know, with, with water pouring, it'd be a little difficult to do that. So the way I fill it, best way, and this is for shallow, even if you have just a little shallow bits of water, you don't need a deep well because you only need to get the tip in this far. So I'm going to just put the tip very, not the whole thing. I'm not submerging the brush tip or anything. Oops. What you need to do is push your plunger in all the way and then put it in your water. It doesn't have to go too far. And if I, could, I hope you can see that. And then I'm just going to pull this plunger up slowly. Just kind of pull it up. It kind of just sucks up the water. Not all the way, but you'll notice he didn't uh, suck it up, and that's normal. I got quite a bit, but if I want to really fill it up, I'm going to just push out that, like I'm just doing a syringe, pulling it up, pushing it up pretty much as far. It goes all the way up, That's basically. See how I pushed it as far as it would go, and I filled this part of the barrel? I'm going to put that. It's not dripping as I do this. I'm putting it back in, and I'm going to just pull that up even more. And then I'm going to just fill it. Now it's um, completely, the whole thing is so is full to the top, which is, I don't think I was able to get that, achieve that before. So with definitely taking off the top, the uh, cap or the tip makes a big difference. So you can travel with it like this. And I do believe if you fill your brushes in advance, I'm going to make sure I don't want to mislead anyone, is you can still, because it has that extendable part, you can fill your brushes full and take them with you on a trip and they're not going to, you know, they're not going to leak or you're going to, you're going to push the plunger by accident and all your color leak or your water leaks out. So that's a feature that's really kind of cool. That's something that is very unique to these water brushes. So 
And, you know, there's a lot of water brushes out on the market and you know what they're like. There are some good and some that don't work so good. So I've got this, this is in our little set that I just unboxed. And I'm gonna take off the piece of paper. And if you would love to, to uh, paint along with me, please do. Yeah, this plunger thing, Mel mentions it. She, you had no idea. Yeah, th it's when you look at it, just straight out of the box like this, it's kind of hard. It's not really intuitive, but even though it does have the directions on how to do it. But when you're looking at it, it's like, how do I, what do I do with this? And actually, that's my first impression of it. When I first saw one, I was like, what? Because <laughs> I'm used to the whole water brush that you can squeeze the whole side of the barrel. Here it is right here, just so you can see. This is the old version. And we still have these. Um, but, you know, it has this really soft, squishy thing. And it has, they have a uh, the similar foamy stuff at the top. But one thing I'm noticing, this is a large, and this is a, that's a medium. Let me show you the large here. Large tip, I wanna show you, they are a little different. The, this one doesn't show as much, but I remember these being longer, especially in the different sizes, like the medium is a little bit, in fact, it's a lot longer of a brush than the medium in the equivalent of the water brush. So anyway, just compare apples to oranges. And if you have these, great. But if you add this, it's not, you're not getting an entirely the same brush. You're getting something different. So here we go. I'm going to show you how it works. One thing you do want to keep around if you're traveling or if you're at home, whatever, you just need a rag or a paper towel because you kind of have to work with the this little push. It says push. There's a little, uh, I, don't know, I think that's called a bladder. If I don't even know if it's a technical term, but a bladder, and if it gets full, it leaks, right? So if you push it, you're going to push on it and it's going to kind of, your water will be coming out. It kind of comes out all over, really. It comes out, but it's supposed to come out in the brush, but it does, what it does is it moistens the brush. It doesn't really come out of that totally. You'll see some water may come out of here, especially when you're first using it, but it should come out of the brush. But just push, that's one way to control your water uh, flow. You can see I'm doing it just a little bit just came out. But if I just do it gently, I'll get the water flow. And it moistens the tip just enough to do your painting. It doesn't saturate. It doesn't spill all over the place. You know, like right now I can do almost a dry brush thing and it's not going to come out. It will keep the, the brush tip moist, but it won't, you know, go everywhere. If you want more water, believe me, when you're cleaning it, you can just push the plunger down and you'll get a lot more water. So you can control the water flow with either the plunger or the bladder, depending on what you want to do. And if you're used to using a water brush, you're, you you can do that by pushing the side anywhere. So it takes, takes a little bit of getting used to if you've never done this one before. So I'm going to grab my watercolors and I'm going to kind of do a little thing like this morning with my uh, class, my watercolor class that I almost missed. Um, <laughs> I took a very, I made some really light washes. And we did a study of light and some glazing. And I kind of want to do that with this, just using these watercolors. And I'm going to take out each of these colors. And instead of doing a really dense, saturated swatch, I'm going to make a very pale swatch. And here I just dipped my brush in the water. Eh, total habit. I'm going to try to not do that. I'm going to try to just use only this because I could, you know, travel with this. And I'm going to put some water in my um, my mixing tray. And I'm going to grab some of this gamboge hue, and I'm going to make a very pale wash. And that means I'm going to squeeze a little bit more water. I may have to go back to my water container, but I'm going to make a pale wash. I'm just squeezing out, and I'm just going to do a little swatch, and I'm going to take maybe a little rectangle shape here. That's pale. It's very pale yellow, very bright and pale. And... Then I'm going to uh, wipe out. I'm tempted to go to that water thing. I think I'm going to move it out of my temptations way. And I'm just going to use this. Now you'll notice that your, if you want to clean your brush thoroughly, of course you just squeeze until the until your wa uh, water is clear. Uh, I'm going to go to the next color, which is my burnt umber. Very light amount of color. I definitely don't want to go too dark on this one. And I'm just going to do a very pale 
little rectangle wall, like a swatch here. Very pale. This is a way you can also add more color. If you want to just play, you can add color at the top to darken it to make yourself a kind of a graduated, uh, like from dark to light. So I made my pale wash and then I'm just kind of bringing a medium tone to the center and I'm going to let that bl blend. Just that's an option if you wanted to try, but we're trying to not use concentrated amount of color. Another thing I like to use is I use baby wipes a lot. I, like, I think they're handy, especially if you're traveling. You have a damp wipe that you can just kind of wipe up your uh, work, and it's kind of handy to have. So, hello. Oh, we've got someone from the UK, Rizwana. So wonderful. Wow. Nice. Nice to, to see you. Well, to, nice to know you're here. I'm going to do the burnt sienna and make a swatch, but I'm going to just kind of dilute it so that it's very very, very pale. And I'm going to, there's a reason, there's kind of a method to the, or there's kind of a process that I'm doing here. I'm going to just show you, because these are transparent colors, how beautifully they layer on top of each other and how you can make beautiful mixes um, using just by layering and glazing. So here's my next color. Let's see the alizarin crimson hue. I'm trying to keep it light. Uh, there it is. Kind of a nice light tone and this is a way just to see how your colors how pale you can make them and like i mentioned in my class today water is your first ingredient today <laughs> because you you just really want to kind of stretch out that pigment mixing whoops that mixed there we go mixing it with more water than pigment and just kind of laying down the color and you know, giving a light wash and I'm just going to go through all the colors so you can see them. And then I'll show you what you can do next. Okay. I'm going to use my water just to, for, to save a little time. And I don't want to run out of my water in my brush. But that's kind of how I, I do this. So this is all, these are all in the warm sort of spectrum. So I'm going to go ahead and stop on this one. And the reason I'm going to do that, I've just swatched out six colors in my cool, I mean, my warm and I'm going to just do that right now. Okay, very pale, right? Very pale. And I'm going to just hit it with a little heat tool because I want to show you the next step real quick. And I'm going to swatch out my next set, my my uh, cool colors, which are on the bottom row, they happen to be. I'll swatch them over, in, over these little washes of warm. And this is just a fun way to get to know your your uh, set here because it really you're going to see something that's different. It's going to look really different when you swatch it out. So I'm getting rid of all my little warm colors here in my palette mixing tray, and I'm going to clean my brush thoroughly to get there. So there's no leftover of the of that color, and I'm just going to take the blue, the first blue, which is the ultramarine blue. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm actually going to go very pale, trying to keep the same saturation level as my first swatch, which is the yellow. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put it right over the yellow, just like this. And what I'm doing is I'm going to create a new color. And what I've made, and this is a combination, and I can write this down with my, uh, I can write it down. Of course, I know I'm keeping track because I know the colors. I'm Glazing, oh, I'm glazing the ultramarine over the gamboge. And look what I got this gorgeous green. It's so pretty. Now I'm going to do the same. I'm going to take the phthalo blue and put it over the burnt umber. We'll see what we get. I've never done this one, so we'll see. This will be a surprise. So I'm going to do a light, really light saturated. And it's got to thin that color down so it's not too much. Don't want it to overwhelm. I want it to just... All right, got to get lots more water. So I need to squeeze. Maybe I'll even use my plunger to get a lot more water. There you go. This stable blue is a very strong blue. Very super strong. So I'm just trying to mix it just to the right amount. Maybe a little bit more color. There we go. Now that's about what I want. I know that's a lot of water there. Oops, got some water here on my paper. And then I'm going to take the same color, and now I've got it over 
the burnt umber and I'm getting this really interesting color. I wish I had some more blue. I think I'll kind of thicken it up a little because it's just not dense. I think it was too thin. So now I've got this over the burnt umber and I love, I'm kind of loving this muted, I don't know what to call it yet, but when it, I'll see it when it dries, it's really pretty. Yeah, very interesting color. Now I'm going to take the viridian and put it over the burnt sienna, which is a really orangey color. So the viridian is a beautiful green, which is a combination of, well, it's a single pigment, but it looks like a yellow, yeah, yellow, and it's kind of on the warm, well, kind of on the cool side, absolutely cool side. Sap green is not, but we'll see what happens when I put it over the other color. Here's the viridian. Oh, very strong. Vir viridian is really strong. I'm going to thin it just a little bit more. It definitely overpowered the, the uh, burnt sienna. So going, knowing, you know, with this knowledge, viridian should just use very, you know, it's a very strong, very strong color. And if you notice, look what's happening on these three colors. They're almost looking like they're the same. They're, it's like they're canceling each other out in a really beautiful way. So I've got the sap green. That'd be an interesting combination. That has some yellow in it, I believe. So it's got some warm in, warmth in it. I'm going to put it over this alizarin crimson. It just may be very much just like what I did. Yeah, it's almost like the same color. So it's got uh, the sap green is muting the the you know, it's totally muting it. So if you like mousy, muted, muted tones, you can certainly get them. But I, I notice they're leaning all to the greens. These look like great greens for botanicals. And let's see what this next opposite. So indigo over the permanent rose. Let's see what we get. This is my first time doing this, Phoebe, just so you know. I'm <laughs> doing this with these colors, and I'm really loving how much fun it is. It's like a little discovery. Now this is the indigo and it's going over the permanent rose and it's turning like a purple, nice muted kind of purpley violet, really gorgeous. I'll have to remember that combination for a shadow because a shadow, that would make a gorgeous shadow color. Now this is purple lake with uh, the Payne's gray. Let's see what we can get out of that. But you, you can just do this all day, make combos, you know, make some combos like this just by glazing so i'm just doing this nice little pain's gray glaze over that purple lake and i'm getting a pretty shadow color but what's interesting if i look the shadow color uh, here the difference the two different ones one has this beautiful pinkish tone because that permanent rose is popping through and the purple lake has got a little more blue in it so look at that isn't that fun so that's kind of a fun way to swatch relax and then you can take like other colors, like if you want to take, do the same thing with your, let's say I'm going to do some light washes of the cool colors and I can glaze over with the uh, warm and see what I can get because everything is going to be different. And I'll just go ahead and grab, oops, that was the ultramarine blue. Let me just take that. This is the ultramarine. The first one's the thalo. That's probably too, you can, so yeah, I'll just do those six colors you can see. I want to make sure my time is good and please ask, ask questions or if you want me to do something, um, I'm here to anything to inspire you to play with your watercolors. <laughs> I'm here for that. Now, this is the look how bright Viridian is just by itself. So now you can see it in its pure tone. Look at that. It looks almost fluorescent to me next to these nice muted tones. And then the sap green, I'm just doing a, basically a light wash, a light, just light, not too much pigment, but just enough to, to show up on the paper, letting the paper shine through. That's another thing in watercolor. And this paper, by the way, is 100% cotton. This is, this paper, I've got arches, I've got every brand um, from the best to the least that best. And I love the way this paper accepts watercolor and it's, it's just gorgeous. It just it does it beautifully. And it does these little outlines. I really like to see um, kind of like the edges that sort of appear once they dry the indigo just by itself. I'm going to do that a very light wash of indigo. And you can do a whole page of these. And you know what you can do after that? 
let's say I fill this up with my uh, this page, and then I can do some mindful art doodling over this, and I can call this a piece of art, or I can send it off as a card. So many things you can do. Let's see, I've got five colors, so I missed one. I don't know which one I missed. <laughs> I don't know, the indigo. I missed the indigo. Or did I not? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Here, I think it's, I think I missed it. Yeah, that the paint? No, I didn't. I looked fine. Okay. Calm down, Karen. So I'm going to, there we go. That's my last one, which is the Payne's Gray. So these are really, all right, good. I want to, because I wanted to show you this and I just kind of, Heat this up, get it dry, because I want you to see what happens when I put the opposite across on top of that. And you you know, it's gonna look different because one layer that's over the other, it's just gonna look a little different. And it gives you these gorgeous little mystical tones. And I'm even seeing a little granulation, very subtle. I'm seeing some grain, kind of a little bit of granulation on these. And I love that because I'm kind of addicted to granulating colors these days. I don't know why they're granulating, but they are somehow. But they're just, or they're just creating little textures with each other. Okay, back to this. I'm going to go opposite of that one. And that one, I'm going to go into the burnt sienna because that's the opposite. And see what happens on this one because I skipped over. And I'm going to get a little different look than what I had on the other one. Just gonna, oops, it's not burnt sienna, that's burnt umber. I'm putting that over that one. And then I'm gonna take, go back to the phthalo color, which I have plenty of in my dish. Oops, not that one. The gamboge, <laughs> getting mixed up now. And I'm just gonna put the gamboge over the ultramarine blue and look at that this is I have a little more yellow but what a beautiful green I'm getting like a citrine oh it's gorgeous it's just to, just to show you how you can make so many colors different from the ones that come out of the of the pan this is uh the next one is viridian so I'm going to do the total opposite of that which is the alizarin at least in the tray it's not really opposite in the on the colors necessarily but let's see how this one works okay so i'm going to make a little stronger amount of alizarin because the green is so strong i'm just going to do a little thing over there and see what happens cancels it it kind of changes it for sure it's canceling out that green but when it dries we'll see what it looks we'll see what the final color is kind of leaning toward the cool side isn't it I think. And it's a nice dark color. And you can achieve depth like this, layer after layer after layer. Um, it makes your color, watercolors, much more interesting than if you were just to put one dark color down the first time. The layering is really makes it uh, makes a difference. I'm going to put some of this rose over the yeah, permanent rose over this uh, sap green. And this just can be like a fun exercise so just to do, just to get to know your watercolors and play. Or you can use this um, technique in any representational things you want to do with your watercolors. Mm -hmm. So I've got my indigo. I'm going to put the purple lake, I guess. I don't know. I just missed one, but that's okay. I'm going to put the purple lake over the, indi over the indigo. It doesn't matter. I don't have to be exactly in sequence. I'm, this is just about play. Of a meditative play. And there it just beautifully, that's both of them are leaning to the cool side. So yeah, I've got a nice brilliant violet there that's even prettier than the original one that's in the pan. And then the last one, which I goofed, I'm going to put some yellow over it just to see what it looks like. I might have missed a color there. That's all right. Then I can discover a new one. So I'm putting yellow over the Payne's gray, the gamboge, and we'll see what we get. And that's a pretty, so the, keeping it light like that. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that, I just love that. I think that's really fun. So I can kind of show you in my, one of my original um, little swatches like that. I just went, did the same thing. You can kind of see 
the background. And this is all with the Niji Essential Swatch Blends and Glazes. So my first one was the swatches straight, you know, pretty as concentrated as I could get with a little bit of more concentration at the top. And this, by the way, I was testing it out on 90 pound arches. Wanted to see how the colors looked on the good stuff, right? Or good stuff. And here they are. Uh, here it is on ours. And I love I love the colors. I love it on this. It's both 100% cotton. But this may be a little more sized. It feels, it just feels a little different when it dries. And these are blends where I blended them directly on the paper. So I put yellow down and then I put the Payne's gray down, let them, let them do their thing. Same with, uh, this is Gamboge with Purple Lake. I wanted to see what Gamboge would do, all of them. This is one way to check a mix with all the yellow blended with the other colors. And you can get, see how many combinations you can get. And these are the glazes with the warm and then the cool. And this is kind of what prompted this demo today uh, was how you can just really create all the colors you need in every watercolor you make. You can do that with these. You know, I have a little piece of, where did I put it? I wanted to show you. I'm gonna grab it. And this is where my class is morning because I have to show my, if any of my ladies are here and for anybody. This is a piece of the paper. This is some other paper, but I want you to see. It's the same, it's 100% rag. Could be one of these, but it's, I know it's not, so. But it's okay. I'm gonna show you. I made this little wash using um the cool a cool wash and i am going to do some glazing and i'm going to kind of explain that so now here i am going to use and make sure i use my brush and i'm going to just do some glazing and i've decided i want this to be warm and the reason i'm going to bring this out because why not i'm going to bring out my little reference my little inspirational reference oh there it is <laughs> let me grab it out for you um i went some did some hiking last weekend or this yeah last weekend and i found this little it's a, a yucca it's a small yucca and i forgot the name already <laughs> but it's a yucca it's just a small yucca and i forgot the title if someone that remembers it would tell would write it in there but it is a yucca and it's all over the desert right now and it's really cool so i just laid it down and i just did a little line drawing with i used a fountain pen but what would look great is you could also use one of these detail master pigment liner which you can also stick in your <laughs> in your little set you can just put one of these a brush and your watercolors and you can go take this to the desert and paint these real life right so i drew this and i'm just going to use some glazes and i'm going to take since this is kind of a you know that's sort of my got my blue background right it's already sky and i'm gonna i see this color instead of just going trying to match the color by looking at it. I see burned umber and gamboge would be my colors probably, but I'm gonna try to cancel. I see this color here. So I'm gonna try to create that color. We'll see if I can do that. I don't know. This might be a challenge, but it's fun. So I'm gonna take my, I will use the yellow first, make a glaze of yellow, a light glaze. And I'm just gonna do it in a, maybe just do a yellow right in here. And I might only do partially, now, normally I use a lot, my brush would be, a, I don't use the water brush very often for just home stuff. I do it for travel mostly, but I'm going to just take my water brush today as if I am out at the, in the desert and I have no other brushes so that this is what I love about the water brush. I'm going to take the burnt sienna and I'm going to just drop that into where, but a very light wash, not a lot. I'm trying to kind of look at my, I'm observed, I'm sort of looking at my little piece here, my little pod thing. And I'm just gonna kind of drop in some color and I may even throw in some blue in there, why not? Um, just to kind of change it up a little, put a little touch of that blue that's in there with the burnt sienna. Yeah, I'm just gonna drop that in get dramatic. I don't need to be perfect. And it doesn't have to look like the thing. It's just, I'm just trying to get the essence of it. It doesn't have to be an exact replica. I'm not doing a botanical illustration where I have to make it look exactly like it. So and I also noticed I didn't draw with my pen those little curly cue things that come out. 
So I'm going to do it with my brush. And this is the beauty of these brushes. This brush is very, gives you a very fine line. Look at that little fine line I got. And I love that. And I can get, I can just create new lines. I can create lines. If I had black only, I could make some nice lines. And see, I'm just kind of, comes to a really nice tip and gives you some nice lines. I'll do that, I'll make some more little curly cues up here. Uh, those little, whatever those are, little things that create that little, whatever those are, pod leaves or whatever they are. There we go. And I'm just gonna just, using these same watercolors and I'm glazing, calling this glazing. And I'm just gonna do the same thing with this one. There, like that. And just putting some, a little bit of brown. Oops, got it. Not go too dark. I'm trying to emphasize the layering part of this process. There we go. And then just maybe add a little down here. And now that's one layer. And I could do more. I can keep going. But I think I'm going to stop with that one for now. And then I could add using my the uh, Payne's Gray or the Indigo. I can create some deeper, deeper colors just a little bit to bring out those little shapes that I'm kind of looking for. And this is very wet. So if I let it dry, I can go in with another, another layer and just kind of bring in, bring out those shapes. There, that's probably, I'll let that sit. And that should just marinate there for a bit. But you can see, this is how um, you can do glazing. And one thing I noticed is I want to warm up that yellow is sort of greenish. So when that dries, I'll go back with probably um, maybe a little purple lake, just a touch. Maybe I'll just try it now and see if I can cancel out that yellow just a little bit, just so it doesn't look so bright yellow. So I'm putting a little purple lake. I'm gonna just do something. I'm gonna put a little bit of that purple lake right in here. See what it did? It just totally kind of canceled that out. I'll do where I see that yellow and where I need to sort of see a shadow. Purple Lake right into there, it kind of changes everything. Just that little change. The glazing. Yes, Joyce, isn't the glazing nice? And it just, I'm doing a wet glaze into wet, but then some of the areas have dried. So some of it's blending, some of it's staying on the first layer, but this is how, this is what it's about. It's getting those colors to make new colors as you layer over them. And that's kind of how, and I'll keep working this until I get the level that I'm looking for, till it kind of looks, makes my eyes go, okay, it's done. And then I'll just keep, instead of doing a really dark stem, this is just a great way. You can just keep adding, building layers, and then until you get that depth and the contrast you're looking for. And that really kind of makes a painting more interesting and and it makes the experience more fun. I'll put a little of this blue, layer some blue over maybe this little spot, maybe a little down here. So I'm really going to take pretty much all the colors that are in this Niji um, essential set, and I can use those to make this picture until it's until I get everything set up that I like. So I'm putting some blue here just so you see where those little shadows are were. I mean, this little, these little things, those are starting to create, getting depth and dimension just by adding uh, another color over it. And, and I'll just let, keep working on that until it's done. And, you know, that uh, if I want to add some light, I think I have enough light here. I don't know if I want to add white, but I could add some white later. I'm going to try to see the lifting qualities of these paints, just for giggles here. Um, if you don't have any way to lift color, another good thing that this little bullet tip is for, I'm going to show you, is for lifting color. If you don't want to use it for anything else, you still want to put water in it. So I'm going to fill it up. I'm going to just kind of show you a little thing. I'm going to do it on this little uh, swatch because I want you to see. We'll see how the, this would work just as a lifting tool. But I do, like I mentioned, I do need to get it wet and kind of condition it so that it's uh, kind of absorbent. I'm getting the tip wet, kind of if there's any starch on it, I doubt there is, but just kind of getting it ready. And then I'm going to fill this one up just like I did the other one. Oops. <laughs> there we go. 
don't need a lot of water in it, but just some. Fill that up. And I've got my little bullet tip, which this is kind of a new thing. Um, we were always recommending this to have be used as a marker to put ink in, but it will work as a blending and a lifting tool. So I'm going to show you that. There, see how it's coming out of the tip now? Totally. Okay. Now I'm going to take it and dry it off a little. And I'm just going to see if this will work. This is my first time. We'll see how it's lifting. I'm going to put a little bit of color or water, <laughs> kind of marker, just kind of dragging it. I'm not rubbing really hard. I'm just barely dragging it. And then I'm going to just lift it, kind of just do it like this. I'm not pushing down on the paper. Now I'm going to take it. And you see I'm lifting some color. So I've got my, you can do this with a brush as well, but this is a little more control than a brush. I'm going to get a, just a solid line, which I won't get with a brush. You know, it's a little harder. This is a little easier. In fact, you can even do something. I'll show you something in a second. See how I'm lifting that? So it's got some lifting qualities, which I love. So if you do make a mistake, you can make a happy accident, right? And do something. Now, here's another way. I'm going to test something. This is a new thing. Take <laughs> I love it, these sessions because I can just kind of figure out stuff as I go. I'm going to make sure the tip is as clean as possible. Yep, see, it's all clean now. And I'm going to just drag this across my straight edge on the side of it, I'm squeezing a little bit of the water out, just a little. Just total straight line. I'm kind of going, I'm just, I'm not pushing down. I'm just dampening the surface. Now I'm going to lift up my straight edge. I'm going to just dab with my um, brush. I mean, my, my look at that. I'm able to see the lifting qualities of the paint. That's two layers, and I'm able to lift. So if you make a boo-boo, and you, or you want to lighten something, I'm going to go back to this now that I have. I'm going to look at my original piece, and I see where I need to be. You know, I can kind of see where the highlights would be. I'm going to try highlighting with this, just with the water alone. So I'm just going to take my my uh, little brush, <laughs> my my bullet tip, Premier water brush, and I'm just going to drag it along where I kind of see where I can do some color lifting. Let's just see. Let's just see what happens. And now I'm going to take it, my and I'll let it sit for a second, and then I'll dab it. Does it highlight? I got a highlight. Not as much as I wanted, but I can still, as long as I don't rub into the paper, I'm gonna I can get a, I can lift. So I'm able to lift. Same here. If I wanted to rub out some of these little goofy little, uh, what do you call these little, uh, someone had that experience today where they were getting little splotches. You can wipe them out. You can just take your little blending, blend it and blob and there it's gone. So there's little ways to cor correct your watercolor if you want to. I mean, I don't normally do this because I like those irregularities, but if you have an area in your watercolor where you don't like those little irregularities, you can use this little blending, very soft. I'm going to blend this little piece out here so you can't see those little um, splotchy things. It softens that quite a bit. So that's another, so that's the beauty of the bullet tip. So um, and I found another use for it that now I'm really happy with. Um, here it is in its real glory. I'm going to turn this over and I'm going to just kind of show you. I've had this filled probably for, oh gosh, Four years now, maybe three years, maybe. So here we go. I'm just going to write. I have this is filled with Sumi ink. Sumi ink is a K, I believe, K Y2. And I've got this gorgeous marker. And it works great. So you can use this if you wanted to take a hig, like a permanent ink, or put some medium in this to make it permanent, like a uh, gum Arabic, not gum Arabic, uh, some acrylic medium, but some fluid acrylic medium. You can make a permanent marker and then you can do your swatches. So let me show you. If you want to test, test transparency in any watercolor, you would lay that down and make sure it's really dry. I'm not sure if this is going to, I think this might move around because I don't believe I have any medium in it. But the way you do this is you test your transparency by putting a concentrated amount of watercolor, which uh, I'm going to do the semi, let's see, I'll use this one, which is semi-transparent. Let's see if we can get, I'm going to put a, a concentrated amount 
Yeah, it's permanent. So whatever I put in there, this is Sumi ink, and it is permanent. It's not moving. And how you can test for transparency and semi-transparency or op opacity or any of that, you just put your color right on the swatch. Hope you can see that. And after it dries, you will be able to tell if it left a deposit of color on your black line. If it does, it's not a transparent color. If it covers the line completely, it's opaque. If it kind of, you know, just leaves a little bit, it's transparent. That's in a very unscientific way, but that's actually scientific. But what else is cool about these kinds of swatching, doing these kinds of transparency tests, or just putting swatches over um, your black lines, I love doing these and then turning these into little focal points or doodles later because you can make these into all kinds of fun things. Um, but it also gives you contrast and that that black that you might be looking for, which you can get with layers. So how's everybody doing? Do you have any questions? We've got 10 minutes to spare. I know it was a simple, simple uh, get together, but um, another thing, I could show you is a little more line work I can do on that if I choose. Uh, how's everybody doing? So, yes. And then this this glazing or this kind of method, you can, like I mentioned, you can build bright, dense colors. Right now, this is really muted. And there's not a lot of saturated color here. But as I let this dry and I keep layering, I'm going to get deeper and deeper colors. So I'm going to just do that. I'll take... My, I'm going to try since I see that yellow tone, but I want it to be more like a brown, and I'm not going to do brown. I'm going to use more of this purple light because I think that's a gorgeous color. It seems to cancel out whatever is in it, what's ever underneath. I'll mix it with a little of that. And I'm just going to do another light wash and right in this area. And this is going to be hopefully dry. Hoping it's drying. I'm going to look at my piece a little bit. And, you know, I here I can just dip, deepen that area one more time to give that kind of dimension I'm looking for. And I'm using the Purple Lake as a glaze, and I'm going to do the same thing with that. This time I'm going to go out to the little line. Really, you know, I can get totally caught up in this. There you go. And I'm trying to get, keep the highlights if I can here. Trying to keep kind of retain some of the lights. And if I wanted to shoot towards the green, I would add some, or actually I won't be able to do green at this point because I've kind of cut that purple on it and it's nothing's gonna, whatever I put over it, that color will show through. But eventually I can go black and get really dark. The more I lay thin blazes down, I'm just gonna show you how that's this is the ultramarine blue, but I'm not going very, very dark at all. It's very light. And I'm just going to kind of make some little light glazes of blue. Here's wet into the wet. And I'm going to do dry here in this part, just a little dry. You can see how this, you can just create your depth this way. And I'll probably put a little bit of this paint break because I'm going to cheat a little bit and try to speed it up just a little but I'm not doing it too, still trying to keep it light, like light washes. Here, I'm gonna just create more darkness by adding another layer of the uh, gray right down the stem here, and maybe a few on the little, the little squigglies. And I'll just kind of add to it and keep playing until you get the depth you want. And that is a really the kind of, and with the set, you can do this anywhere. You can go do it on the on the fly. Oops, I just went outside the line. Oh, no. <laughs> Actually, I don't mind going outside the lines. Sometimes I do it on purpose, but this time, I, that time I didn't. So transparency here. All right. And I think that one is probably going to, looking for a quote or a little word, maybe. And maybe I can add some highlights. But there okay. it is. Yes. Could you go in close up for a second? This one? Yes, that's the one. I think. So it's not dry yet, of course. It's going to take, you know, it's going to lighten up as it dries, and then I can keep playing with it. But that's 
kind of the you know exercise or the the, the um wanted to show you the versatility of these paints because I'm able to get all that from just from these colors. I, it's a totally it's completely different. If I were just to do it straight, it would be a totally different painting, and that would be fun to do this exact thing using just straight colors, and you'll see a big difference. So I'm hoping that was close enough for you, and and then you enjoyed the glazing with the Niji essential watercolor set set. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, and the blending with this. This was something new. Not the blending, the color lifting. I love doing that. This was actually an exercise. I'm going to just blot this up and look at it now that I've seen that. I'm going to try one more thing because now I'm really on a roll here. <laughs> Using this marker tip and just really giving it a little more pressure without scrubbing the paper. Now I've got this interesting line work going on. So this is something in like a mixed media, if you're a mixed media person and you wanna create some new marks, here's, here's, a, here's a way you can do it right there. I like that. And after that, and after I'm finished with that, I can go with a little uh, pen and make some kind of doodle abstract art with that. And I forgot to lift it. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a little lifting on that so you can see how light I got that. That's so fun. I'll put that in one of my uh, as one of my focal points. <laughs> Any more questions? Everybody's good? Phoebe, do you have anything good. you wanted to add today or? Um, no, I think yeah, I don't think any more questions, but people really loved the glazing and the layering techniques that you shared today. And then when you were doing your yucca and adding the glazing to that, beautiful. Everybody seemed to really enjoy that one. Yeah, I'm at... really glad. Oh, nice. so this one was like a beginning. I started the drawing. Um, the way I did it was really simple, was just to kind of, this is where I want to encourage people. Oh, I can't draw. You know, people go, oh, I can't draw. It's okay. You don't have to be a an accomplished uh, draftsman. I'm going to just show you a little thing. This is something to take away with and try. And don't be judgmental about your results. Okay, don't just just go for it. And don't even you don't even have to look at your paper. This is something in art school we all had to do blind contours. So you take your and literally you take your subject, whatever it is. And you don't, you have your your uh, paper away from your subject. If you feel more comfortable doing this kind of thing with a pencil, by all means, it feels less permanent. You can always erase it. Um, but here's, I'm going to use this pencil and I'll just show you what I mean. Um, if you haven't done a blind contour, I'm looking at this. I'm not going to look at my paper, even though it's, I see it in my peripheral vision. But I, I want to look at there. I want to change it that way. So I'm going to turn it landscape. So I'm going to do just this drawing. And I'm going to do it with a pen. I'm going to be bold. I'm going to be bold and I might even do a thicker pen. Let's see. I'm going to grab a thicker detail master because I want you to see the lines. There's a seven. I'm going to use the number five. It's not really thick. It's actually thinner than a micron number five. So I'm going to start at the direction of growth or from the left of the page. I'm just going to look at my... I'm not going to look at my paper. I swear, if you could see my face, well, I kind of peek sometimes. Oh, it's not even doing it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I have to get the pen started. So I'm just kind of doing this thing where I'm not looking and my pen isn't flowing very well. Sorry about that. Um, but I'm just going to create, and I got to give myself room here. And really, do not be judgmental. If you do this on your, with your, um, hands you can do your hand what's in front of you i'm going to do this and i'm just it doesn't look anything like the thing right i mean i don't think it's going to look like the thing but i'm getting a an impression of the of that thing okay then i can stop let me pick up my pen and i'm going to look at it oh okay so that's what that looks like and then i'm going to just continue a little bit here with this little i'm not looking at it now i'm just kind of doing my thing there, there it is. Okay. And now I'm going to go, I'm going to look, picking up my pen, looking at the, I'm looking at it. I'm going to go down here where I kind of can start this and I'm going to let 
do the same thing. Just kind of go and kind of observe the little pod thing. It's not, I'm just think, looking at it. Once in a while I cheat and I make a little glance, but it's a very, very brief glance so that I kind of know where my pen is going. If I, you know, if I want to keep that. And I'm going to go stop my pen there. And I'm going to just kind of complete it there. And I am done with that drawing. Oh, I can, then I can kind of join these little pieces together. And I'm going to use my, I'm looking, I'm actually looking now. So I can kind of finish this off a little so it looks kind of like it's supposed to. <laughs> but there, and if I wanted to add a little more drawing, you know, let's say some lines in here, I can. But this is an exercise you should try. And do, using these postcards are perfect. Or these five by sevens, because, you know, you've got a nice format to do a drawing like this. And you can do this, take the same thing several times and you'll get a totally different drawing. So try doing that. And then you can do some coloring later. Um, definitely do some, you know, watercolor washes, like kind of like what I do with that. So I hope that inspires you to play with your watercolors. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. That was awesome. Um, so if everybody wants to share anything that they've done, that would be amazing. Yes, please. Like, if you want to share, like if you painted, please share on, on Instagram. You can tag Yasutomo, tag me, Karen Elaine Creative. Um, you can, always tagging is better than a hashtag. So if you want us to see what you've done, um, please hashtag uh, not hashtag tag us um and you know yasutomo would love to see what you're doing with these beautiful products and i'd love to see it too 